Hello Internet, welcome back to the Experimental Cataclysm. If you don't know, this is the show where we talk about some of the updates that have come to the experimental version of Cataclysm over the last couple of weeks. Um, there are timestamps in the description, as always, and of course, there are some spoilers for Cataclysm. Specifically, today we do have a new monster, uh, so I am going to be giving a brief rundown on what that has to offer. So if you don't want to know that, uh, you'll have to... I mean, stop watching or check the timestamps and skip that one. So, because I don't care about spoilers, that's kind of what the show is about. So I do have a lot to talk about this week um, that interests me. So we're going to just be trying to run through these pretty quick uh, because I'm afraid I'm going to get off on a tangent on a couple of these and um, it might be a long show. So let's just jump into it. We're going to be quick and straightforward. And we're going to plow through here. So first off, we have the Science ID cards have now been added to a possible drop for Zombie Scientists. Previously, you could find Science ID cards. Obviously, in the lab, there are certain locations that are, are they, they're set up to spawn the ID card, specifically the finale. Um, but not every finale has a Science ID card. And this person, Termini, uh, has decided that they should add the Science ID card to the Zombie Scientist loot pool. Which to me makes perfect sense and really it should have been that way forever. I did see some people saying, hey, you know, doesn't this make the lab a little bit easier? Um, but honestly, I would say that really most of the time when I would go down to the finale, there was pretty much always a science ID card at the finale. And on the rare chance that there wasn't, yes, you can turn to scientists uh, in hopes of finding a science ID card drop. But the reality is that most scientists don't really spawn in the lab anyway. They spawn in the prisoner containment section. So if you're, say you're doing a lab playthrough, you just start the game without a pickaxe or like a really high computer skill, you're not even going to be able to get to the vast majority of scientists because they're locked behind that prisoner containment door. So they don't really spawn out in the lab very often. I would say I've been in labs maybe a dozen times over the last a few months and I don't think I've seen a single scientist outside of the prisoner containment area so I'm not super concerned about this debalancing things um, but it, it is a concern some people had and I'm real quick I'm gonna check how frequently they actually drop and here uh, just doing the quick debug test of the scientist ID group or um, scientist death drop group I found that the science ID card, we only got three out of a hundred drops. So it doesn't seem like they're that common. Um, it seems like three out of a hundred is pretty dang low. You're much more likely to get other things. So even if you're able to get into prisoner containment, is there a way to search this ID? Um, even if you're able to get, here we got five. Uh, if, if you're even able to get into prisoner containment and actually kill the science zombies, you're looking at in one lab, there's maybe two in each one, maybe 10 or 11, 12 or 15, you know, 16 chances to actually get the ID card. Doesn't seem super likely. Um, certainly it's possible and certainly it can change the balance of things, but it's not, um, it, it certainly is not a reliable way to get these cards. But I wanted to mention it because it's something that makes sense to me and I wish I had, you know, really kind of thought of because it, it is something that probably should have been that way for a long time. Moving on, we got the addition of Supreme Pizza. And if you don't know, a Supreme Pizza is generally a term given to a pizza that has lots of different toppings or at least a combination of meat and veggie. And so in the game previously, we had meat pizza, we had veggie pizza, and, and that, was, that was really it. So we now have Supreme Pizza, including a recipe for Supreme Pizza. I assume that they added them to item groups. It may just be that they added a recipe that can use a variety of... Um, yeah, I don't see anything about item groups. It looks like it may just be a recipe. Hmm. Well, whatever. You can use a combination of meat and veggies, uh, which is, you know, the whole point. It's a neat little thing. Uh, I like Supreme Pizza in real life, so I thought I'd throw a shout out. Next from Frizz, we got the CBM Auto Start Threshold Option. And this was something that Frizz actually pointed out to me on Discord um, because I had Honest, I just missed it, you know, which happens occasionally. Sometimes these shows, I don't have time to do a lot of research or I miss a, you know, a PR here and there. But I actually really like the idea of this. And so basically this adds the ability for you to, let, let's say we have the uh, metabolic interchange CBM. We can now set that up so that if, hey, if I get down and my bionic power is 
25% of its maximum, we can automatically have that metabolic interchange toggle on and then begin sapping our calories for energy until we would reach the, the cap, right? And so it should auto off when it, when it caps out. And you'll see, uh, I should probably have zoomed in a little bit. You'll see here, um, this is the uh, bionic, uh, this is the CBM menu. And here you'll see we have the A to toggle auto start menu uh, mode. If you press that button, it will bring up this menu. This menu allows you to choose when to uh, toggle that on. So you can start below. Ooh, spelling error. Below is uh, only a single L. I also noticed you have a typo in your uh, in your title. Don't hate me. I just I, I, I noticed these things. Anyway, uh, if you're below 25%, you can set it. It will auto toggle on at 25%, 50%, 75%, whatever. And then when I asked them, I said, you know, hey, does it auto toggle off at 100% so we're not overusing, like, uh, you know, overusing the CBMs? I don't know if they work that way. Like, if I have metabolic interchange on and I'm at 100%, does it continue sapping energy calories for energy or does it just not work because it's already at cap? I don't know how that works. Um, but he said, yeah, it should toggle off, so it shouldn't be an issue. So pretty neat little change. Um, it lets you have a little bit more control over when your bionics are working without having to constantly micromanage them. So I thought that was really good. I know a lot of you love CBMs. I love CBMs way more than I like mutations. So that kind of quality of life stuff is always always welcome. So Next, we have two PRs that uh, increase the amount of alcohol in the game. Not the amount, I'm sorry. The different types of alcohol that are available in the game. The first PR is from Brightonwalda, uh, which is just adds various different types of specifically whiskey and fortified wines. Uh, and then they added them to item groups so that they will be spawning in the game. They reference mansions. I don't know, maybe they didn't add them to like the uh, liquor stores and such. It might just be mansions. Um, but this was the first change it added, uh, I think, three different types of whiskeys. I did look at this, but now I'm not remembering, honestly. If you, I mean, you're going to start noticing them in, in the game, and you know, you can check for yourself if you're super interested in what type of alcohol was added. And then we had a second PR from LeVay and Fiend that I, it just adds them to recipes, updates their descriptions. Apparently, I thought they also added more liquor in this particular PR, but that may not be correct. Again, I didn't really take a look at this in detail because I don't, I mean, I pick up alcohol sometimes when I find it, but it's not something I go out of my way to have, so it doesn't interest me too, too much. Um, but here's an example. We have single pot still Irish whiskey, which is a new type of whiskey. I did see some people saying, like, do we really need more alcohol? Um, but personally, I like variety the more like I feel like there should be variety in all aspects of Cataclysm because it helps um, just flesh things out. You know, you get tired of seeing the same exact, oh, it's another bottle, it's another jug of cheap wine, oh boy. So I'm I'm pretty okay with seeing additions like this. But I thought I'd shout it out. I know some of you are Alkies and you probably love your liquor. So, And liquor's a good uh, morale booster in the game. So figured I'd throw that out there and let people know that, yes, new new booze. Next, from Davy Bones, we have a PR. So, so basically, in the game, when you have morale and you eat food that has a positive fun, or it's referred to fun, but it's your morale, whatever, um, it increases your morale, and oh boy, we're so happy we ate those toastums. Well, now, if you eat the same food over and over and over, it actually will give diminishing returns on how much morale it actually boosts you. Um, specifically, this is called the monotony penalty, which has been added to food items. Uh, it's a new uh, part in Jason. You will now have the ability to add this to um, foods in the game. And basically, it decreases their enjoyability over time up to 48 hours, uh, up to a cap. So basically, if you eat the same food over and over and over, you'll get diminishing returns. But after 48 hours of eating it, uh, you will start to regain your morale boost from eating that specific item. I think this is a great change, uh, frankly, because, you know, it's it, it it just closes up an area that people often exploit. I see people all the time in Discord saying, oh, I just, well, whenever I'm sad, I just drink this over and over and over, or I just do this over and over and over. And it's kind of nice to break that up. Personally, for me, when I'm playing a game and I want to boost my character's mood, I don't eat the same item over and over. I say, okay, 
well, we want to be in a good mood. Okay, we'll eat a toast them. We'll have a swig of beer. You know what? I'd like a little bit more. Let's eat a little bit of a chocolate bar. I already do this in the game, so for me, it's a very low impact change. But I do hear people all the time saying, well, I just drink until I'm happy. Uh, so I do like this a lot. I don't know if 48 hours is the right time window. I didn't really give that a lot of thought. Um, but you're definitely going to be noticing this, those of you that min-max and, and try to uh, exploit things over and over and over for uh, positive morale. Definitely going to notice this. Just change it up. It should be a very low-impact thing. Um, I don't see any problem with it. I actually really like it. This is something we have talked about multiple times on the forum or the Discord about, about doing things like this. Um, and uh, we've talked about favorite foods and things like that as well, but that's obviously a completely different. Anyway, I don't want to ramble. Let's move on to the next thing. Next, from another simulacrum, we got a revamp of the EMP grenade and a recipe. So, seeing a little bit of pushback on this uh, from Discord, I've had multiple people bring this up and kind of be frustrated with it. Uh, the idea is that EMP grenades, as they were in the game, are not real life. There's no real life equivalent. There's nothing in real life that is a handheld grenade that creates an EMP blast in a circular area around the grenade. And then in addition to that, um, you could very, very easily craft EMP grenades. So it was one of those go-tos for like lab starts and, and mid-level mid survivors taking them into labs and anywhere that there's a turret and things like that. And um, never made sense. I never liked the EMP grenades. They never made sense. I mean, they made sense when the game was set in the future. But now that the uh, the actual date of the Cataclysm was moved back to, like, modern day, it doesn't really make sense that EMP grenades exist. They've been phasing out a lot of the sci-fi content, um, you know, that are a little bit more outlandish. And EMP grenades are something that they just they don't exist in real life. But basically, another simulacrum has taken the old-style EMP grenades and replaced them with an EMP bomb, which is much more sensible, um, because EMP... You can create EMPs. So uh, I, let's not get into super detail, but the gist of it is that, yes, EMPs exist. Yes, you as a uh, person living in your house with some electronics knowledge, you can produce, like... Uh, a relatively large item that can produce an EMP in a certain directed area. It's complicated. You know what? You have Google. You can figure out if they're vaguely realistic or not. But my concern was the size of EMP grenades not making sense with real world um, like equivalent devices. And then two, the idea that this would be something that would be well documented and easily understood by a survivor with relatively low electronic skill seems real unlikely. And they were trivial to craft, which was like, it was laughably easy to make. And so a lot of that was addressed in this PR. Specifically, there were multiple items added that were specifically added for the manufacture of EMP grenades, just to make that a little bit more complicated, I would guess, just to um, increase the difficulty with which a survivor would craft EMP grenades. They're still craftable. They're just not really grenades anymore, and they require a little bit more work. And then also, it's worth noting that Hub 01 is about the only place, uh, or is the only place in the game that you can currently find these EMP um, bombs uh, out in the world, right? They're not added to loot tables or anything like that. They only will show up at Hub 01. So, yeah, I don't have a lot to say about this. There is a GIF showing the explosion and whatever, but that's not uh, super helpful. And it doesn't really relay a lot of information to you. So, I don't, I don't, I don't have a lot to say about this. I like this change. I think a lot of people don't like this change, but I think it makes sense. Um, we're not going to go into any more detail on it, I don't think. I don't have a lot to say. Um, because for me, this makes perfect sense and I really like the change. So do your own digging if you want to know more about this. Uh, and that's about all I got to say. Next, also from Davy Bones, we have incorporate human meat and fat into existing recipes and remove the dedicated recipes. So previously, if you were crafting any of the human meat cannibalism recipes, they had their own special recipes that showed up in your crafting menu and you would craft them individually now you should be if i understand this right you can now use human meat in basically any recipe that accepts meat 
and it will inherit cannibal flags from the human meat. So instead of having those specific recipes that you need to craft individually, you can now simply use human meat in any other recipe and it will convert the resulting food into a cannibal food automatically. If I'm understanding this right, we did this with some other things. I think this is where the mutant meat was having some issues with the exploits. Now, I did see someone on Discord saying that some of the individual recipes still exist in the game. I'm sure they'll phase them out over time. And I also saw people asking, do they maintain their names? Um, and they should. Uh, I think it depends on the recipe. But for instance, you know, we have all these, like we had Cooked Creep and Luigi Lasagna and Man Brats and things like that. All of those things should have carried over. I'm not sure if all of them have or if only some of them or how how, how thorough they were in, in putting this together. Uh, here we see a screenshot where it shows that the old names were preserved um, if, through this change. So don't, don't be mad that they don't have the same name. They do have the same names that they always did. Um, and the red, of course, indicates that these are cannibalism recipes. And in addition to that, here we have an example of the old, basically, if you have a cannibal recipe that also is a mutant meat recipe, that it will give additional names based on that. So here we have chili con chupacabra, for instance, and bleak brat baloney, and uh, amoral abomination aspects. Um, so the naming convention has been maintained, which I think is probably the main thing that people really like about the cannibalism recipes. Um, but they're no longer dedicated recipes. I think this is a great change. I think more things in the game should inherit from their... Um, I mean, that's the whole point, right? Is that they inherit flags now from other things, and that prevents a lot of the uh, recipe complications that we've seen before. Yeah, I don't know. As I'm talking about this, I feel like I'm not making a ton of sense, so let's just move on. Next, we got a new zombie. Uh, this particular zombie is the Zapper Zombie, and to my understanding, this is meant to be an early game version of a Shocker. They may... Now, if I'm understanding this right, this uh, PR also removes Shocker Zombies, like the standard Shocker Zombie, from appearing in the early game spawn lists, okay? So previously, some like so after the evolution changes, the most scary thing you're gonna run onto, into on day one most of the time is going to be like a, a zombie sh a shocker, right? Or a soldier zombie, that kind of thing. But for the most part, you're not going to run into really high tier stuff. It's mostly low tier stuff. But I guess some people take issue with the shocker being a little bit dangerous on day one. And so I'm, if I understand this right, it not only created the zapper zombie, but it replaced the shocker zombie in the early spawn. So you shouldn't see shocker zombies anymore uh, on day one. You should really only be seeing zapper zombies. Taking a quick look at their health and whatnot, looks like they have, I mean, not great health, pretty average speed. I believe this is the same speed as your standard zombie. It actually has less HP than your standard uh, regular zombie. Regular zombies have 80 HP, so it is a little bit weaker than your standard zombie. From that perspective, they deal uh, pretty basic, not very much damage in melee. They do have a melee shock. Um, so you get that zap back ability that can uh, deal damage to you if you're using a metal weapon. And they basically drop very basic um, zombie clothing items, you know, cash cards, all that basic pocket crap that you find on most zombies. And then here it's listed as having uh, CBMs. That's incorrect. Uh, they do not have CBMs. They're the only one in the shocker variants that currently do not contain CBMs. As far as I'm aware, it's only this creature that does not have CBMs. There's talk about redoing CBM stuff in the future and, and changing how you find, um, you know, bionics in these creatures. So we'll talk about that when it comes, but for now, just know that this one does not have uh, CBMs to harvest. It'll give you basic zombie harvest, you know, so tainted meat and, and such like that. Uh, it also upgrades into the zombie electric, which I believe is the shocker zombie. And uh, it does that with a Half-Life of 8, which is pretty fast. Uh, it's about the fastest you're ever going to see on a Half-Life. So probably in a week or two, you'll start to... Well, a couple of weeks from now, you'll start seeing a lot more Shockers and a lot fewer zap uh, Zappers. So once you get moving in the game, it should be uh, moving on to the Shockers and the uh, Shocker variants. So yeah, just a new creature. Always like seeing new creatures. Um, they're some of my favorite 
things, you know, I like new locations, new uh, professions. Well, not so much. New scenarios um, and, and new creatures. All that stuff is, is what I look for content. I like new content. So uh, we saw these in my most recent Let's Play, which um, probably isn't up on the channel at the time of recording, of uh, putting this up. So can't link you to that. But yep, uh, they're around. And then finally, probably the biggest thing that I wanted to talk about the most is that um, Irk has been putting in some effort at giving the starting evac shelters a, a real facelift. They're, they look a lot... I mean, okay, let me take you back to a couple years ago when I first picked up Cataclysm, okay? Little baby unicorn, uh, watched a bunch of Vormithrax videos and uh, decided, you know what, we start in the evac shelter. Everyone says start in the evac shelter. So I started... An evac shelter and back then the evac shelter was literally just a box there was no uh, roof to it there was nothing really special about it and I was excited to play cataclysm and I walked over to the lockers over yonder and I found two safety blankets uh, or whatever they're called emergency blankets and I was like all right well that sucks it's the evac shelter why isn't it stocked with a bunch of stuff but I thought okay there's a basement let's go check out the basement so I went down in the basement I opened the door uh, and there was a can of tuna and there was a pair of jeans and I thought wow this sucks there's nothing here and then I ran into I think it was a spitter zombie actually I don't really remember what it was but there was a zombie in the basement and it murdered me and I was pissed because it's like I just came to play the game the <laughs> evac shelter that is supposed to be like the hub for new players has nothing in it there's a monster in the basement and like what the what is this this is not what it should be like and so i was very frustrated and uh and i'm really super happy to see that someone is like we've had other updates people added layouts to the evac shelter they got a roof they got some cool stuff going on but for the most part it still was just this empty building that and we removed the zombie spawns i believe from basements as well but um you know it needed something it needs to be Okay, so let's talk about the BR, because I'm, I'm an idiot. Um, so basically, w w this adds multiple layouts to the existing evac shelters that are much more realistic. So that, like, things like, um, there's, there's going to be higher loot density. We saw this. In fact, I'm just going to jump over to the game, and we're going to take a look at a couple. So here I've just spawned in an evac shelter. Um, you go in, you'll see not only has uh, some of this been damaged, including the doors and the windows, but there's also graffiti. I cannot read that. Something, yeah, I have no idea what that says. That's fine. Can we ex interact with that in any way? This is a drawing of a zombie with a bullet hole in its head. So they've been graffitied up. Inscription, they're hiding the truth. Uh, oops, yeah, that's a little too close for comfort. Uh, this one just says mom. Fantastic. Uh, you'll see some of the furniture has been destroyed. Um, but there is loot here. And that includes protein rations, which are like super good for new players. There's a uh, well, pamphlets, just world building. We got some gummy vitamins. No, examine right there. Why is that not working? Okay. Uh, Ah, because I turned off my numpad. Always good. You'll see there is a first aid kit, which are a pretty common uh, thing to find in evac shelters now, which again, really good for new players. These shelving units seem to be pretty empty. Uh, and here we also have more protein rations, which again, very good for um, new players who don't know what they're doing. Uh, and so we have a pretty well stocked um, shelter. I it's not as good. There are some better ones, but we found quite a bit of stuff here. Here we have one that is in better condition. You'll see there is still graffiti. Gabriel Dong, Comrade Gary, Comrade Gary, Snow Meow, Michael Hill. I would not be alive without all of you. I will not forget. Interesting that it uh, gives duplicated Comrade Gary, but that's fine. You'll see once again, many, many protein rations. This one has not been gra graffitied or uh, vandalized quite as much. You'll see we also find things in the shelving units, which are, you know, a little bit more valuable. Finding a uh, flashlight is pretty good, um, but mostly it's the protein rations that seem to be in bulk. Um, and this makes sense to me. This is what the shelter should always have looked like. It is a government-funded shelter 
that is specifically stocked for the purposes of an emergency. And so it's really nice to see just a boost to a lot of that stuff. I'm assuming, let's get ourselves a clairvoyance artifact. I'm assuming, ah, so they put the toilets downstairs. I was gonna say there's gonna be stuff down here as well, but it actually looks like there's not much. So just based on this quick uh, peek around, it seems like rations are by far the most common thing. But the reason this is such a good change, okay, so I, I explained why I didn't enjoy being in the evac shelter when I was a new player. And that's, that's mostly what it comes down to. When a new player picks up Cataclysm, we've done a lot over the course, not me, they have done a lot over the course of the last year or so to make the game much more approachable for new players. And that includes things like the evolution changes that made the game significantly easier in the early game. The changing of the start date uh, to the 60th day of spring is a big deal because many new players were freezing and not having warm clothing or knowing how to heat up food, things like that. We have done, they've done a lot to make the game much more approachable. It's one of the reasons I respect Vormithrax so much is that his videos specifically cater to new players which will bring more people to the game. And so when a new player picks up Cataclysm, what is the very first thing that they see? Well, usually it's the evac shelter. 90% of the time they go with the stock standard start or they saw a video and someone recommended that they start in the evac shelter. So they go in the evac shelter and we really, we're not putting our best foot forward. And this facelift helps make this shelter much more appealing to a new player. It makes the game a little bit easier for them. It gets them to engage longer in the game, which will lead to higher like numbers for long-term players. I understand Cataclysm is a difficult game. They're going to die. Of course, we all die in Cataclysm. But the more we can do to make the game right off the bat engaging and equip people in a way that lets them go have fun instead of grinding and dying repeatedly, they're more likely to continue playing. And if we can increase our player base, it's gonna increase the number of contributors. It's gonna increase the number of people creating content for YouTube, putting it out there a little bit more, playing it on Twitch, getting more of an audience. You know, it's gonna increase the number of people coming to Discord where we can engage with them and convert them to long-term players. And so this kind of stuff, and I wanna point out as well, we've been getting a lot of work done on houses. Um, and really houses are the same way. It's like the second thing that players are going to see once they get into the game is houses. Um, you know, cause it's one of the first things we're going to loot. Oh my God. What is that? Just a looted devourer. Got a tile apparently pretty, pretty freaking creepy. Uh, but we're also getting benefits from houses recently as well. Single use storage, the uh, nested map gen creations, uh, or the nested map gen stuff for houses. We got rid of procedurally generated houses which were those big empty houses with like the furniture in front of the doors and kind of weird nonsense. Um, and so there's a lot of stuff that's being done that makes this game look and feel a lot better for new players. So just a big shout out to everyone that's been doing that work. I know Irk did the uh, facelift for the shelters. I want to say David P.W. Brown was the person working on... Oh, I might be wrong. I don't know who's been working on the nested map gen and that kind of stuff. I think single-use storage was either Korg or Urk, I don't really remember. Uh, but whatever, shout out to everybody who's been contributing because this kind of stuff, it's just, it's good for the player base and I'm excited to see that. So yeah, just wanted to talk about that a little bit. Um, it, it's neat, you know, I don't think I've had a start in Evac Shelter in like a year, I don't play there anymore. Um, but it's 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 just, it's so good for new players. I'm Whatever, I've talked enough about this. Um, it's a good change that I'm happy to see, and I appreciate the work being done by the dev team because I always try to give shout outs because I feel like people complain a lot, but that doesn't mean, and especially because uh, lots of us who have been around the game for a while, we talk about end game content, we want more end game content, well what do you do once you beat kind of everything in your board, um, but we, I, I, I always try to bring it back to new player experience, um, and, and that's been, anyway, Okay, move on. Anyway, that's really all I wanted to talk about this week. Um, everybody, thanks for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed the episode. I'll, of course, be back with another episode of Experimental Cataclysm in the next week or two. Um, and we'll talk about new stuff and all that good stuff. I will be here even if that's, you know, around Christmas time. I'll probably do a show as long as there's content. So uh, come on back, check the channel occasionally. And uh, yeah, 
So for now, thanks for watching, and uh, I'll see you next time.